I can hear you, yes. Okay. You? Perfect. I uh, just want to make sure we're going to wait for a few seconds because people are still joining. Okay. Are we okay on the video? Because I can't see any. Yes, we're fine. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Dr. Uh, Mark Basim from the Ear Institute in Lebanon, CMC, will be giving us a lecture about intertympanic therapy in Meniere disease. Dr. Basim, thank you for accepting to give this lecture. And I'll uh, hopefully uh, leave five minutes at the end for questions. Hello. Hello. Hello, doctor. Sir, I can, yes. can you start? I can't hear you. I don't can know you hear? We can hear you perfectly. Okay. So I'll go ahead and start. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you again, Solara, Dr. Seno, for this invitation. And uh, thank you to Dr. Al Faragal. I don't know him, but I know a lot of his work. And uh, this is a great initiative that you have been doing on the web, especially in these times. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think it's uh, you know it's a good way to communicate uh, during these difficult times at uh, at home. Uh, we decided today to discuss intratympanic therapy in Meniere disease. It's a little bit of a niche topic, but I think it's. Uh, you know, it's interesting, especially, you know, luckily, uh, or, you know, there are no good coincidences. There are no coincidences, I should say. Uh, last week, the new uh, clinical practice guidelines were released uh, from the American Academy. So this is a very timely topic. I will start, you know, my discussion about uh, a little bit of a historical background. You probably all know uh, the story of Meniere's disease that was first described by Prosper Meniere in 1861. It was a symptom complex that includes episodes of vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. What I didn't know initially, but I learned uh, as I was reading more and more about Meniere's disease, is that Dr. Meniere, when he was describing that, uh, that uh, symptom complex, was actually trying to prove that uh, vertigo episodes uh, are due to inner ear problems and not to uh, brain issues as it was thought until then. And so his attempts to uh, report patients who had these episodes of vertigo and hearing loss uh, was essentially to prove that it was an inner ear issue rather than a brain issue. Uh, now, in retrospect, some of the patients that he described we now know are more intralabyrinthine hemorrhage rather than the classic, what we today call Meniere's disease. Uh, but I think it was a, it was a landmark discussion in, uh, in the progress of uh, otology and uh, in inner ear pathologies. Now, the interesting thing is that we're almost 140 years later and still, this is uh, still a clinical diagnosis, uh, meaning it is a diagnosis that depends on sitting down, talking to the patient, getting an exact history, uh, and we'll get to the criteria in a, in a, in a few slides. Uh, there are quite a few tests that we may or may not do for, for the patient in terms of hearing tests and balance tests and imaging tests, but really the diagnosis is essentially clinical. Again, sitting down, talking to the patient, doing your bas basic uh, otologic and neurotologic exam, uh, and, and working on the diagnosis uh, that way. The other thing that has changed with time as uh, we understand Meniere's disease more is that it's probably more of a syndrome and less of a disease, meaning it's not one single entity. Uh, we probably are talking about different pathologies in the inner ear that manifest, have the same manifestation. And that's, you know, this is the case more and more in medicine. We, what we used to think were one uh, disease are now a multitude of pathologies uh, masquerading as the same symptoms and disease. Uh, and why is this important? This is important because probably as we move further along with therapies and treatments, uh, it is important to differentiate the different underlying pathologies that give us these episodes of vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. Now, speaking of pathophysiology, uh, you know, you cannot mention Meniere's disease without discussing endolymphatic high drops. Um, this is the prevailing theory of what is going on in the inner ear, and it's essentially in excess in endolymph, as you see in the, on the right of the screen. Uh, the endolymphatic compartment is distended. Uh, now, is it excess production, reduced uh, absorption? Uh, this is, you know, a long discussion we won't have time to get into today. Uh, you probably have heard that it is controversial in terms of whether endolymphatic high drops is actually a cause of the disease or it's just what we call an epiphenomenon, meaning something that happens to be there in the inner ears, but it's not necessarily a causal 
uh, relationship between high drops and Meniere's. I think the, the, the pendulum has kind of swung the other way now and we're thinking more and more that, you know, it probably is, uh, is the underlying pathology of, of uh, Meniere's disease. Um, there's actually a recent uh, long discussion in autology and neurotology, and I encourage you to look at that. But basically, uh, the reason a lot of people said, well, no, you know, hydrops has nothing to do with Meniere's, or at least it's not the cause of Meniere, is that on imaging or on pathology, temporal bone histopathology, there are quite a few years with hydrops, uh, but no symptoms. Uh, now that we have more uh, developed tests, electrophysiological tests, such as the VEMP, the vestibular evoked myogenic potential, we think that these are kind of dormant or, or subacute uh, uh, ears that are, have some symptomatology or at least have some abnormalities on electrophysiological uh, tests, but do not have the symptoms yet. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at a lot of the symptoms of Meniere's disease, if you do the old now, it's, it's not in favor anymore, but the dehydration tests, a lot of times these symptoms reverse, so lending more uh, credence to the uh, endolymphatic hydrox theory. The other uh, theory is that of membrane rupture, and that's not mutually exclusive with uh, hydrops. Uh, and if you have rupture of the membranes and mixing of the endolymph and perilymph, then you get an imbalance in the uh, ionic composition of the fluids and then the resulting uh, disturbance of the sensory epithelium, with, which causes hearing loss and uh, vertigo. Uh, and we are discovering more and more, I would say this is almost uh, universally accepted now uh, that uh, Meniere's disease it has a strong uh, inflammatory and probably an autoimmune component. And the seat of that, uh, that autoimmune activity or inflammatory activity is probably the endolymphatic sac. There's a big body of evidence that comes from uh, mostly the lab of, of uh, Jeff Harris at University of uh, California in San Diego. Uh, there are quite a few interesting papers there. Uh, and we'll address that in the discussion uh, further down uh, today. Now, the most recent criteria for uh, Meniere's disease uh, are the ones that were published by the American Academy of Pathology Head and Neck Surgery about four years ago now. As most of you probably remember, we used to have four categories of Meniere disease, certain, which required the patient to be dead because we needed temporal bone histopathology. Uh, and then we had definite Meniere's disease, which is still there, probable Meniere's disease, which is still there, and then possible Meniere disease, which we got rid of. So what is definite Meniere's disease? A patient has definite Meniere's disease if they have two or more episodes of vertigo lasting anywhere between 20 minutes to 12 hours. They should have an audiometrically documented low or mid-frequency sensory neural hearing loss, which is a hallmark of the disease, fluctuating symptoms of tinnitus, oral fullness, and hearing loss, and of course, no other diagnosis, meaning you've ruled out retrocochlear pathologies uh, or something else that could be causing the same symptoms. Probable Meniere's disease has only two things that are different compared to definite. One is that the episodes can last up to 24 hours. And the second is that this is a patient who does have all the symptoms, but you have not documented hearing loss. They, they report some changes in hearing, they report fluctuating symptoms of tinnitus, but you don't have documentation of, the, of hearing loss on, on an objective pure tone audiometry. And so you classify them as probable Meniere's disease. What is the treatment uh, for Meniere's disease? There is no consensus treatment protocol. Well, actually, that, that's not absolutely true because there is, uh, when I was reviewing the literature uh, last week for this, there are three consensus uh, protocols. And when there are three consensus protocols, you know, we don't agree on something. Uh, so, but there's, the, there's an overall sense of what should be done for this disease, and we'll address that in a minute. But why is, you know, a disease that's been around for 140 years, why does it not have proper treatment? Why do we not understand it better? Uh, one of the things that will come up frequently during your, this talk and during any review of Meniere's disease is the really poor quality of the studies, meaning the studies are all over the place. The, the measures that we use are not uh, consistent. Uh, the definition sometimes is not consistent. The definition has changed over time of Meniere's disease. As you see, we have recent guidelines. The second problem is that Meniere's disease is unpredictable in nature. Uh, you know, you could have an episode 20 years ago and another episode 10 years uh, later and then now the patient comes to you because they're having frequent episodes of vertigo. There's nothing in the definition that limits the time period. Um, and then they can go on with a you know, quiescent uh, disease or quiescent period for months and years on end. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to judge the outcome of your treatments. The second, the, the other issue is that what outcomes are we gonna look at? And how do you measure these? Uh, are you looking at just the hearing, the, the balance problem, which is the main issue, the vertigo, is it the imbalance also? Is it the hearing loss? 
Um, and how do you measure them? Is it just subjective questionnaires? Do you look at objective testing for, for balance? Uh, the other thing is when do you measure them? Like if you look at the classic uh, recommendations for, for outcomes of Meniere's disease by the American Academy, we should get the you know, number of vertigo uh, episodes the six months before the treatment. You give the treatment and then you look 18 to 24 months down the, down the line and compare that other six month uh, job. So you give the treatment to it about a year and a half and then and for, you collect data for six months uh, and you compare them to the pre-treatment. Now, scientifically, that's probably valid, but uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have in my practice a, men, a patient that is willing to wait a year and a half to tell you if they're still dizzy or not. So, um, and then if you measure them too close to the treatment period, then you know, how do you know that it's not the natural history of the disease and, and, and the treatment of uh, the, the effect of your treatment? The other thing is that if you give it time, uh, it will eventually go into remission or at least it, most of them will burn out. So for example, in this review that was just recently uh, released in 2020, 57% uh, of patients are asymptomatic, either in remission or mostly burnt out in two years. And in eight years, 71% are already uh, in burnt out. So that gives you an idea of the difficulty in, treat in, in uh, differentiating the results of treatment. Now, treatment protocols, I think, you know, what you see on your screen, most of us agree on. Lifestyle changes, I cannot stress it enough. Uh, you don't jump to, to medical therapy with these patients. It, it has a role, but really you have to educate them about the disease. You have to educate them a bit about the pathophysiology as much as you can. And talk to them about a low salt diet, low caffeine diet, low alcohol diet, and proper hydration. Uh, again, one of those interesting things, we don't know why these work. Uh, we have a few studies of average quality, I would say, that look at the effect of salt and caffeine on uh, on uh, Meniere's disease. Uh, it is a sense, an empiric sense, that most of these uh, therapies work. Uh, I can tell you, I have many a patient who is, <clears throat> excuse me, well controlled, and then suddenly they go out and eat uh, some food with, with, a, with a lot of salt in it, and they come back the next day or a week later spinning uh, and, you know, completely out of control. Uh, so it is important to reinforce these, <coughs> excuse me, these lifestyle changes uh, and be fairly strict with the patient about them. Now, if we talk about pharmacotherapy, you know, oral systemic therapy, the diuretics are fairly well accepted. Probably the most commonly used is hydrochlorothiazide. Alternatively, you can use acetazolamide. Uh, beta histine has been a bit of a controversial issue uh, across the globe. It is still not FDA approved. Uh, there's a Cochrane review, which is, I think, a few years old now, which does show some, um, some possible effect of beta histine on, on, on uh, on the symptoms of Meniere's disease, there's another big uh, review, it's called the Beta Med, I think, which shows no difference. Most physicians will start with it. I do start with it. Uh, I think beta histine, personally, from my personal experience, does uh, make a difference for the patients, and I would give it for a two to three month course. Uh, the other thing is migraine therapy. Now we are talking more and more about migraine and dizziness in general, but specifically in Meniere's disease, up to 56% of patients in some review of, uh, of patients who have Meniere's disease have a concurrent migraine, and that's obviously a much higher prevalence of migraine than it would be in the general population. Uh, I would say that if you have a patient in which you've maxed out on lifestyle changes, diuretics, beta histine, and they're not doing well, um, there is some evidence in the literature to go with a migraine therapy, and, and you know, uh, I personally use the, the uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, as a test try to see if their symptoms are controlled. And you'd be surprised that many of them just, you know, magically uh, a month or two later, their, their symptoms are well controlled. So I would recommend you try that, especially if the patients have concurrent migraine uh, symptoms. Uh, steroids are helpful. Uh, oral steroids have been shown because there isn't, as we said, anti, you know, an inflammatory and autoimmune component to Meniere's disease. So it's worth considering in flare-ups. Now, if you follow that, about 75% to 80% and probably even more of patients uh, have good control of their disease. They go you know, symptom-free or almost symptom-free uh, for a month and month and occasionally years. You will have the occasional seasonal 